Let's review where we've come so far. The purpose of this module is to set up clearly defined, realistic and helpful goals. An aspect of that is to find new ways to think about problems that open up new opportunities for moving forward. This is known as reframing. In parts one and two, we've looked at problems and then goals, and now it's time to take a look at reframing. So again, reframing just means taking a problem and recasting it in a new way, seeing it in a different way or from a new perspective. You're taking the same facts of the matter, but reinterpreting so that they have a different meaning or significance. Here's an example of a reframe. In the 2011 Masters Golf Tournament, Rory McIlroy went into the final day with a good lead, but then he blew it. He had what's been described as a meltdown. He failed to win the competition, presumably because nerves got the better of him. Later, he described that day as the most important day of his career. That's a reframe. Actually, top sports people do it a lot. Basically, he turned an abject failure into something of real value. The value being that he realised he had to learn to handle pressure. And indeed, later in his career, that's exactly what he did. Of course, he still lost that day. It didn't change the fact of the matter, but he changed the story in his head to one where he may actually have felt quite grateful that it happened to him. Implicit in the idea of reframing is that we encounter situations in life which don't have inherent meaning or significance, but we create that meaning by how we think about them. And we actually have quite a bit of freedom over how we do that. Actually, I've already touched on a more general example of a reframe in part two of this module, when I talked about the growth mindset, which remember is the view that problems can be overcome by effort and commitment. Suppose you failed an exam. From the point of view of a fixed mindset, this is evidence of your shortcomings, your inherent lack of ability and talent. But the growth mindset sees it as just a temporary setback, an indication that you need to put in more hard work and application in order to pass it next time. In the growth mindset, a failure is never really a failure, it's just feedback or an opportunity for learning. So reframing is fundamentally about the thoughts we have about situations. It's about stories in our head. It's about finding a new story that's constructive, spurs us to positive action, or opens up new ideas about what to do, or it simply makes us feel better. So reframing is useful for problems or situations where there seems to be no solution. They look like no win situations. Reframing doesn't offer solutions to insoluble problems, it just changes the frame of reference to a different but related problem, one that can be solved. In a way, it's just about asking the right question. So often the first step in working with real problems is to find the right question, if you like. Reframing is very often about taking a broader perspective, taking in more of the situation. Here's a simple example. Suppose you ring a friend and leave them a message, but they don't call you back. Hours later, you're feeling pretty bad about it. If you assume that they got your message, but just didn't bother to call you back, you'll feel bad. You may start wondering if you did something wrong, or, or maybe they just don't like you. Reframing could mean simply considering different possibilities. Maybe they weren't feeling well and just went to bed and turned off their phone. Or maybe they're having a very busy day and had no time to call you back. So when you consider these possibilities, you don't feel so bad. Or reframes can change the focus or the emphasis within the problem context so that you see the real problem is not that, but this. This is very often what's needed in cases of stress and anxiety. A naive goal might be to avoid anxiety or prevent it from arising. That's problematic for reasons I'm about to go into, but basically it's not really possible to completely prevent stress arising. Rory McIlroy knew he couldn't avoid pressure, he had to learn to deal with it. So a more realistic goal would be to learn how to recover from stress. What we're doing is substituting an insoluble problem for a related problem that is much more workable. At this point I'm reminded of the famous prayer that they use in the Alcoholics Anonymous organisation. Paraphrasing it, it's suggesting that what we all need is three things. First, the courage to address changes we're capable of making. Second, the serenity to accept the things that we can't do anything about. And third, the wisdom to know the difference.
how you view stress or your stress mindset is profoundly important. Why should that be so? Remember, a mindset is a deep-rooted belief that conditions how you see the world and how you think, feel and act in response. Most people have a negative stress mindset, meaning that they view stress as harmful. Stress will impair your performance and your productivity. It'll harm your well-being, your quality of life, and it'll even harm your health in the long run, and so it's best avoided. So it's not surprising if this is your view, given the coverage of stress in the media, and indeed there's plenty of research evidence backing it up. But actually, it's not the whole story. Other research appears to be contradictory. It suggests that stress actually helps. It can help your performance and even benefit your health. For example, researchers have looked at the stress response in people sitting exams. They've measured the stress response in terms of increases in stress hormones, such as adrenaline and cortisol. And what they found is that people who have relatively bigger increases in these hormones actually do better. They have better results. This is a rather shocking finding. Let me just repeat it. The bigger your physical stress response, the better you do in exams. And it's not just relatively minor stress where this happens. One study looked at survivors of road traffic accidents. They looked at stress hormones to see if they could predict who would go on to develop PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. What they found was that the people who did subsequently develop PTSD actually had a lower stress response. Their bodies produced a smaller rise in stress hormones. If you believe that stress hormones are essentially harmful, this result is the opposite of what you'd expect. Let me repeat the finding. A flood of stress hormones after a traumatic event like a car crash actually protects you in the longer term. Researchers are even trialing giving people supplemental stress hormones as a way of protecting them against PTSD, and it actually seems to be showing some promise. So the reality is that stress hormones actually help you handle stress and the physical stress response as a whole helps you deal with stress better. The next exercise is about finding out what your stress mindset is. Give some thought to the following questions. Think about how you would have answered before seeing this presentation. Write some notes. One, do you believe that the effects of stress are on the whole negative or positive? Two, in your life, do you try to avoid stress or do you embrace it? Three, how do you believe that stress affects your well-being, health and vitality? Four, how do you believe stress affects your performance and productivity in your work, but also beyond? Be honest with yourself. The most important thing right now is to find a true appraisal. We'll talk about changing your stress mindset later. So what we've been talking about is a reframe of stress. Stress is not in itself harmful. In fact, it helps. The physical stress response is designed to give you energy to deal with a challenge. And indeed, that's what it does. So in short, stress is not a threat to be avoided, but a challenge to be embraced. That's the reframe. We're not changing stress, but what stress means. Having this positive stress mindset is what helps you perform better and even benefits your health and well-being. And it doesn't just help for relatively minor stress. It works for major anxiety too, including social anxiety. I'd like to turn to another reframe. This one is an example of changing the emphasis of a problem. It's the quicksand metaphor, and it's quite a fundamentally important reframe for our purposes in this course. Let's go back to a common problem that I first mentioned in the introduction of the course, insomnia. So you're lying in bed and you can't get to sleep. It seems like the harder you try or the more you want to get to sleep, the further away from sleep you actually are. Probably we've all been there. The reframe is to see this as an example of the quicksand trap. Quicksand is a metaphor. In quicksand, if you struggle, you'll sink down further. Quicksand doesn't have a magical power to suck you down. If you don't struggle, you'll float. Struggling doesn't work because you don't have solid ground to work against. 
So the quicksand trap means any situation where trying harder makes things worse. And there are lots of examples in life. Sleep is just one of them. Trying really hard doesn't get you to sleep. So in the sort of quicksand situations that I'm talking about, the problem is in your own mind. And you're trying to use your mind to get away from part of your mind. Again, you don't have solid ground to push against. OK, to summarise, the basic reframe inherent in the quicksand metaphor is the idea that the problem is not what you think it is. The real problem is that you try too hard or try in the wrong sort of way and end up making the situation worse. In the sleep example, taking a while to get to sleep is not in itself the end of the world. You'd probably get to sleep eventually, but not if you whipped up the problem in your mind, for example, by worrying about the consequences of not sleeping and getting even more desperate to get to sleep. So what you need to change is the trying too hard. Now, having done the last exercise, I hope that you've been able to see that the quicksand trap is rather common and particularly so in stress and anxiety cases. Because the stress response feels bad, because anxiety feels bad, it's natural to want to get away from it, either by avoiding the triggers in the first place or by attempting to suppress the experience in whatever way you can. But more often than not, that just gets you more anxiety if not in the short term, then in the long run. Now, I realise that at first sight, that doesn't sound very helpful because it seems like I'm just saying you've got to put up with the problem, like not being able to get to sleep. That's not what I mean to say. I'm not saying all you can do is resign yourself because there are definitely proactive things that you can do. And that's what the rest of the course is about. I'm suggesting that we need to shift the emphasis for the problem away from avoiding stress and towards building resilience or the ability to quickly and easily recover from stress. In the longer term, the more you build your confidence that you can handle stress, the less stressful you find things. But in the short term, it's necessary to let go of the idea of avoiding or suppressing stress. This reframe is just the beginning really, but an important beginning. Because if you don't take it on, then all the methods that we'll cover later have a chance of being ineffective. So what I'm going to do here is to present some ideas and models which are basically just elaborations of the basic quicksand reframe. They're helpful ways to think about quicksand situations that suggest more constructive ways of applying yourself. And there are three models or three reframes, three further reframes if you like, that I want to present. The first is the idea of a distinction between different forms of suffering. So suffering is a common feature of the problems that brought you here. Primary suffering is just the fact of the matter. It's suffering that can't really be avoided. Secondary suffering is a kind of mental elaboration of suffering into something worse. Let me explain that with an example, the example of pain. Now, the problem with pain is that it hurts. And of course, you want to get rid of it. You want to block the experience of pain. That's natural. But it's not always possible. The question then is, what attitude do you take towards the pain? The sort of mental elaboration that is secondary suffering can take the form of projecting the pain into past and future. Say you get stung by a nettle. It hurts, but you know that the pain will just wear off. It's nothing too bad. Not much secondary suffering there. But if you get a chest pain, well, you don't know what it is. You start to wonder if you're having a heart attack, maybe. You get into the fear that it will get worse in the future. This is secondary suffering because it's a proliferation of the actual pain. Or suppose you've got chronic pain. Perhaps you've had it for years. You can fall into reflecting on all the things that you haven't been able to do in your life and that you've missed out on, or how you'll always have this pain and have nothing to look forward to and it's really ruined your life, that kind of thing. Then again, you're adding a lot of secondary suffering on top of the basic present moment fact of the matter of pain. And we all do this to some extent with suffering, both physical and emotional. As a practitioner, I've had lots of clients, lots of anxiety clients, where the real problem is fear of fear. They don't live the life they want because of the threat of anxiety or panic. So my main point here is that we should target our efforts on secondary suffering. 
I'm not saying that's easy. I don't mean to downplay the nature of chronic pain, but the point is, if we try to block primary pain, which is the fact of the matter, we just tend to suffer more. So a major form of secondary suffering is simply mental struggle, the struggle of trying to reject part of your actual experience, trying to hold it off or push it away. I call this resistance. I'll be referring to it throughout the course. The next model I want to present is called the Human Performance Curve. It's certainly not my own idea, in fact it's quite widely used and you might well have come across it before. The Human Performance Curve is a graph that shows the relationship between performance and effort, or sometimes stress. So we have effort shown along the horizontal axis, and we have a peak of performance, or a point of optimal performance if you like. The idea is that Peak performance is a matter of balanced effort or application. Beyond a certain point, trying harder doesn't help because you're overhyped in some sense or over aroused. Let's take an example. Suppose you're a golfer and you're about to make a put into the hole. Your best chance of making it comes with a certain level of effort or perhaps better physiological arousal. Too little, perhaps because you're not really concentrating, you've got other things on your mind and you're likely to miss. In that case, you're somewhere here on the curve. But suppose that if you make it, you win the golf competition. That adds a certain level of stress. Now, maybe your body is over aroused, causing you to fluff it. Suppose on your next put, you think to yourself, come on, get a hold of yourself, just try harder. The result is that you're here on the curve and you're going downhill. That's the quicksand trap right there. The author Daniel Goldman puts it like this in one of his books. This end of the curve is the zone of boredom or disengagement. You need more effort, more focus. But at this end of the curve, this is the zone of frazzle. You're overhyped or over aroused and you need to go back this way. And in the middle here, we've got peak performance or flow. We could also call this region good stress. It's the place where stress works for you and it's where you can maintain your positive stress mindset which, to recap, sees stress as a challenge to be embraced rather than a threat to be avoided and the stress response as your body's rising to meet that challenge. Here you're confident that you can handle the stress as opposed to frazzle over here where that confidence starts to break down. So I think the model of the human performance curve can make a lot of sense. I hope you found that. And I think it can be helpful in a practical way in addressing problems, especially in light of the mind-body connection that we talked about first back in the introduction to the course. Remember, it's just the idea that how we think, feel and act is reflected in what our body is doing and vice versa. So I've already spoken of the human performance curve in terms of physiological arousal. The idea is that there's an optimum level of physiological arousal, a level that will give you peak performance. Too much takes you into stress and anxiety and frazzle. When we find ourselves in a problem situation, we need to think in terms of the performance curve. Where are we in relation to it? Are we left or right of the peak? And depending on the answer, we need to exercise one of two complementary faculties. If we're to the right, if we're in frazzle, we need to reduce arousal. We need to exercise our ability to calm down, to let go and to be more accepting. If we're to the left, we need to exercise effort or even willpower. We need to increase arousal. As a generality, I would say most of my clients tend to be on the right and they don't really know how to move left. They're quite competent with effort and willpower. That's their style of coping, but it's often imbalanced. They haven't developed the ability to let go or to lower arousal. So a lot of the course is about that leftward faculty, how to reduce arousal. But at the same time, I don't want to devalue the other one, the rightward moving faculty, effort or will, because we always need to be balancing the two. Solutions to real problems almost always involve effort and will too. Take a problem like a phobia. Let's say a fear of crowded places. 
Yes, you can develop your relaxation skills, but at some point you're going to have to test out your learning in context. You're going to have to get yourself to the supermarket or whatever, and that's going to feel uncomfortable no matter, no matter how much biofeedback you've done, because you're going into the unknown. So you have to be willing to face that. Part of the process is that you have to be willing to push to the edge of your comfort zone, but not beyond. I stress that, not beyond. Just to reiterate a point I made earlier, we can train your ability to recover from stress or your resilience, but you have to start with some stress to recover from. Okay, now the third of the three models that I mentioned that expand on the basic reframe of the quicksand trap. This one I call the dual intelligence model. Again, I didn't invent it, though I may have come up with that particular name, but the basic idea is widespread. The model is a response to a type of situation where we find ourselves unable to access resources and abilities that we know we have. In the sleep example, we all know how to sleep. We all do it every night. We just can't do it when we want to. On that day in 2011, Rory McIlroy's golfing skills deserted him. He found himself unable to do things he probably does every day. Again, I think we've probably all had this experience in some form or in some level. How do we make sense of it? Well, one answer is the dual intelligence model. The basic idea is that there's more to us than our conscious self, our thinking and willing self. There's another part to us, and this other part is able to do things that our narrower selves can't do, like fall asleep. So in the model, I call the two parts the thinking intelligence and the body intelligence. There are both ways of understanding and knowing things, but also doing things. The thinking intelligence is more associated with our conscious selves. We solve problems by thinking about them, coming up with a plan of action, and then deliberately acting. So the thinking intelligence achieves things by thinking, reasoning, and willpower. But that's not the only way of doing things. We can also do some things quite automatically, without reasoning, without willpower, without thinking even. Indeed, many things are best done this way. These abilities reside in the body intelligence. I've called it the body intelligence because it includes things that the body can do, like walking and running. But you could also think of it as the subconscious mind or the automatic mind. Take eating, for example. The thinking intelligence knows that sugar is bad for you and vegetables are good for you because they contain useful vitamins and minerals, etc. And you can make decisions to eat on that basis. But the body intelligence knows when you're hungry and knows when you've eaten just enough so that it's time to stop. And you need both. Your eating behaviours are best done on the basis of the two intelligences working together, even communicating in some sense. That's why I've drawn them as overlapped circles. Problems come when they get disconnected, or worse, when the thinking intelligence tries to over-appropriate and do things that are best left to the body intelligence. This is quicksand again. So to repeat, you could say that the body intelligence knows how to fall asleep, but the thinking mind doesn't. You can't do it by willpower. When you try, you simply get a conflict between the two parts or within the mind, and the result is that it doesn't work out. You don't get to sleep. So this is the basic idea of the dual intelligence model. I'll be coming back to it again later in the course, but just to summarise, it's a way of thinking about problems where we can't access our own inner resources. We can't do what we know we can do. It essentially reframes problems in terms of using the wrong part of the mind or applying yourself in the wrong sort of way. And the challenge becomes, how do we access the resources of the body intelligence at will, so to speak, if not by willpower?